Ascend, Life on the Autism Spectrum. This is our finale show for 2018, a very interesting year. I'm your co-host, Keith Halperin. And I'm Will Burnick. And today our program is Autism Hiking the uh, Pacific Coast Trail with our special guest, Paul Nussbaum. But before I get into that, I've got to ask Will, what the holiday is with your sweater? <laughs> I'm glad you asked. For the, the season fina- this season finale shirt, it isn't isn't a shirt. It's my Christmas sweater. I, I'm I'm wearing it to, I'm wearing it to to get ready for the Chris to get ready for Christmas. Since since everyone's so into wearing Christmas sweaters, I'm, I I'm gonna wear mine to 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 celebrate the holidays. Uh, everyone out, everyone out there is just gearing up to celebrate Christmas, Kwanzaa, Hanukkah, and arbor day so 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 merry christmas and happy holidays very very Mm. good we'll now get into uh discussions with our special guest paul nussbaum and will you take it from here gladly let's start with the background when did you first start thinking of the pacific trail hike well uh this this hike has been something that i've wanted to do for a long time and I actually started, I started conceiving it about a year and a half ago. And, and then I came about, yeah, a little over a year ago, I had, had this hike as a plan B. Because originally I was gonna, originally I was gonna mm-hmm. do an expedition across the ice cap of Greenland to raise, to raise awareness for, for the, I mean, for the issues and to showcase abilities for, people on the autism spectrum including myself and and the thing was that we didn't get we didn't get the funding for the for that Greenland project so then I came up with the idea of doing the Pacific Crest Trail as a plan B so as soon as I found out it was about a year ago that we weren't going to get the funding then I implemented this project and I was actually looking at this project six months prior to that Mm. as a plan B if for some reason we didn't get the funding so obviously we didn't get the funding so then as soon as I found out then I started implementing this project and that was exactly a year ago today or this month yeah. and then from there then I started putting the pieces together the planning and preparation last spring and then I launched it in the middle of, let's see the middle of June June 14th to be exact of last of this year <laughs> and leaving from Tehachapi, uh, California down down south. How long did it take you to plan the hike? It took to actually plan it, it took me about um, I was preparing actually preparing for about six months and was conceived of it Ooh. over a year for over a year and the actual nuts and bolts of the planning took me about 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 six months, I would say, and then I really got serious toward the last three or four months before I left. That's when I started doing all the serious preparation for it, and getting equipment and food and logistics, and then just putting it together. What were the goals of the hike? The goals of the hike were there. Was, there's there's two of them. Number one is to was was the awareness was the autism advocacy awareness project that I was talking about that was uh, that what the Greenland project was supposed to achieve and uh, number two was for my own uh, my own spiritual Mm -hmm. development and both of those ended up being accomplished uh, throughout this expedition the four and a half months that I was Mm -hmm. on the on the trail (laughs) Excellent. Can you tell us a little bit about the uh, autism advocacy awareness aspect of that? Uh, yes. The autism awareness advocacy of that, I, like I said, originally I was going to be doing the project across Greenland, and before that I did two winter expeditions mm-hmm. to prepare for that, and obviously that project didn't get funded, so I went with the plan B of the Greenland project. And the autism awareness specifically is to erase, 
I mean, to raise awareness about the autism issues and to showcase the autism abilities mm -hmm. and to show people what is possible. And for me, being on the autism spectrum, I mean, facing some of those challenges mm. to showcase what is possible. <laughs> I mean, granted, I mean, I'm not totally, I mean, I'm not extreme, but I have had my challenges. So that, that, was, that was a big item for me and to overcome, overcome my own limitations. <laughs> Excellent. And uh, the, other, the other thing was to showcase this on a, on a global, on a, on a public level. Can you tell us, Abe, about some of the challenges in general that you faced on, on the hike, and, and more specifically, B, could you tell us what one specifically regarding uh, your autistic uh, characteristics were most challenging? I think for me, one of the biggest challenges was, a lot of it was just day-to-day -day survival. Whoa. Some days were just, I mean, more challenging than others. <laughs> I mean, much more challenging than others. And one of the things that, and one of the things that my autistic traits got in the way of was getting stuck. I mean, I mean, was perseverating on certain mm -hmm. certain issues, and certain I mean issues that were going on in my mind, and also on situations. And one of the things that I learned was that I had to get past those issues I had to train myself to get past those issues places where I got stuck and specifically those were like I mean thoughts I mean negative thoughts that I had fears mm -hmm. that I had how I was going to deal with the situation I had to determine if the situation was real or imaginary I had to sort that out I had to shrink the mountains down to molehills, mm -hmm. and even try to reduce the molehills. Mm. You know the you know the saying, making mountains out of molehills. I had to do just the opposite, or I mean, just for my survival, just and for my I mean, for my life. Mm. Could you tell us um, about the details of the hike? Uh, when did you start? How did you do it? Okay. Now, so, anyways, I started. I started the hike on in the middle of June, June fourteenth, from Tehachapi, California, which is about fifty miles east of Bakersfield on Highway fifty eight. Uh, dri driving there with another friend, and stayed overnight in the motel in a motel the night before we started, and then launched the day after. And that section was it was about a hundred miles, hundred. 140 miles. The first 140 miles was through desert and heat. It got um, like over 100 degrees in some of those areas over a lot of hills. <laughs> and so that was the first part. And essentially, the hike went, I went through the, and then from the desert, went through the Sierras, the southern Sierras, and through Sequoia, Kings Canyon, did, ended up, by the way, up to Yosemite, mm -hmm. and by the way, I did 90% of the John Muir Trail in that hike as well. And then from Yosemite up to Lake Tahoe, and then from Lake Tahoe northward up to Mount Shasta, another 400 miles. And so I, and when I went to the when I went to the Sierras, it was very very rugged, mm -hmm. very little resupply I had like 12 day stretches on several of those several stretches were like almost two weeks stretches and I had times when food was very scarce and the other thing was is that there were a lot of thunder showers when I the first part when I was going through the desert there was a lot of heat it was hot mm -hmm. I had to carry five liters of water uh, going through some of those sections and I could, it's like I could see that cold mango juice in the sky, that juice that I wanted so bad. <laughs> and in there, it, 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 all it was is just to remain in the sky. I was not to have it for a long time. It was not to be a reality in that 100 degree when I was sweat was just dripping off my forehead. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, after that, I mean, later on in the hike, I went to the, when I went to the Southern Sierra, 
there were a lot of thunder showers. Mm. I mean, drenching rain, hail, sleet, all of that, and going over rugged terrain. Mm. And so I just went through that number of those days where I was just dripping, dripping wet, and I just had to make the best of it. And so then I just continu continued northward from there. And a couple of those times I had to go down for a resupply. I was going to try to push through the, for the first 200 miles, which was unrealistic, I realized, once I got into the, I mean, when I was in the Southern Sierra, hmm. to try to push to Mammoth or Red's Meadow, hmm. which is, yeah, which is right near Mammoth, mm -hmm. actually. Hmm. But so, anyways, then continued north from there through Yosemite, and then fortunately the weather cleared up. It got, I mean, it got drier. But then later on, when I was going through Northern California, mm -hmm. when I got to Tahoe and beyond, it got cold a number, number of those times, and it was very dry. Hmm. I mean, I had to go out of the way to get water. Hmm. I had to bushwhack several miles off the trail a few times to get water. And did you know where to get water, or how did you find the water? Well, I found it uh, on, I had a map of the lakes and streams. I mean, I used a map all the way up to about, all the way up to Sierra City, which is 100 miles north of Lake Tahoe. When I got north of Lake, when I got north of Sierra City, I started using an app called Guthook, I mean, which has all the features, which is a map, an uh, electronic map on my phone, mm -hmm. and that has all the water sources and descriptions listed, so I used that. And some of them were dried up, but then it also had the location of lakes and the streams, and then I knew where to find the streams, looking for the plant life, mm -hmm. plants and animals that hung out there, and that, that located that gave me a clue as to where the water was, and then I just pieced it together in some situations. Excellent. And Jennifer, I uh, you have a question. Yeah, so we talked a little bit about how you were able to keep yourself hydrated, but what about fed? What did you do for food out there where they don't have any restaurants or grocery stores? Well, that got a little challenging sometimes. I had to, I mean, well, I had to carry all my, carry all my supplies. I mean, and what I did was generally resupply every 100 miles approximately, usually like once a week. For the first part of the trip, it was in the southern, going through, to, going through the desert and the, and the southern Sierra, resupply was very difficult. I had several, like three two-week sections, almost two-week sections where I didn't have resupply, where I didn't have resupply, and it was a balancing act between having enough food and not over and not carrying, not having too much weight. And there was a couple of times when I didn't carry enough food. And the last three days, basically, I was picking up crumbs out of the ground. I was very, I mean, very depleted on um, for a, quite a number of those days, <laughs> especially for the first part of the expedition. Later on, once I got past Lake Tahoe, I was able. I worked out a lot of the bugs, and also resupply was more frequent and regular. So I was able to. I, had, I, I was able to organize the the resupply better, and I had better selection of food you know, with the food logistics. So you had pre-supplied food caches at the resupply point, or how did that work? I had some resupply, but I didn't have resupply. Resupply was very sparse. Yeah. I didn't have I didn't have the resupply between uh, let's see Kennedy Meadows and Tahoe, which was about a 400 mile stretch. Good grief! I mean, I had I had to go down and I mean I didn't have boxes. I had to go down. I had to go out of the way and get. And get resupply. Yeah. How, right. how many miles did you hike? Well, it varied. There were some days where I hiked 20 miles, and then there were other days when I was going through rough terrain or really burned out at high altitude, or the weather was very difficult and the, I had to cross streams where I only hiked like seven miles mm -hmm. 
or, le or, or less. And the other thing I didn't share was when I was going through the Southern Sierra, I had to cross a lot of rivers and creeks. Okay, great. And also, there were a lot of thunderstorms. I had to go over a, quite a number of passes that were close to 12,000 feet. You described earlier uh, some of the mental challenges you faced. What would you say your, your most uh, daunting physical challenges were on the hike? The physical challenge, for me, the physical challenges were being physically depleted, mm -hmm. burned out, and then just keeping going when I was burned out. And I had to make decisions with, I mean, and even with my drill sergeant methods, mm -hmm. I mean, they, they could only go so far because I could push myself so far, but then when my body was just depleted, then I had to stop and rest and regroup and recalculate what I was doing and figure, refigure out my logistics. And I had to do that in the beginning parts of the expedition, more or less. Thank you. The hike, overall, the hike was close to 1,000 miles. And, and how long did it take you? And it was about, Four, I mean, four and a half. I was on the trail for four and a half months, and I would say probably about four, just a little bit of under four months of actual hiking because, I mean, I'm factoring in the, the resupply stops. Jennifer, you had a follow-up question. Yeah, so I was wondering if you either read Cheryl Strade's book, Wild, about her hike on the Pacific Crest Trail or watched the movie they made of it with Reese Witherspoon before you set out and did that was that part of what inspired you to that make this was, hike? That was part of what inspired me. And I did I did read Cheryl Strade's book Wild and I was really inspired by it and I was thinking about it quite a bit as I was doing the expedition. And when I came home, the first day I came home, I started reading her book and it just brought tears to my eyes oh, I when I started getting into it and I still go back and read it and it's like it's like now when I read it it's like I get a lot more out of it yeah so it really I mean it really it really hits me to the core I yeah really did you find you had a lot of similar experiences to hers well I did in the sense I mean our experiences were different but a lot of but the challenges, the internal challenges, were the same. I mean, I think, I mean, she had different experiences, different issues, but her issues were just as difficult for her as my issues were for me. And one of the things that the trail does is it, it makes you dig deep into yourself. And as she was digging deep into herself on the trail, I dug deep into myself and each for us was just just as challenging just in different just different issues but same form indeed i understand you uh were in communication at various times with uh with some of our ascend members i was yes i was in communication with the ascend members with yep with greg who is my support person and and I have to compliment him for doing a very good job and that providing that life, that link. And uh, Camilla and just just all you guys just cheering me on. And that helped keep me going through the heart, through some really tough spots. And not to mention the Ascendigo organization mm -hmm. based in Colorado. And Ascendigo is another autism advocacy organization and they provide services, various services, and a summer camp for people on the autism spectrum. And they're based in near Aspen, Colorado. And they were a supporter. They were a supporter as well. And just having them getting a card from them and just having their support was really, I mean, inspiring as well. Really good. From this from this time going forward, right now I'm just uh, taking a break for Christmas for Christmas. Uh, vacation, and then I'm going to be starting to move move forward. I'm looking at for next for next summer, and for looking at continuing where I left off, mm -hmm. for at, at Mount Shasta and going and hiking another 600 miles up to Cascade Locks, and I'm looking also at the possibility of doing Washington, 
as well. I haven't, I haven't made that decision. I'm also looking at in the later spring around May, the possibility of doing Southern California from the Mexican border up to Tehachapi where I started and before started going to start uh, going back up to Mount Shasta to resume the portion where I left off. <laughs> so, so this, this, I'm, the specific plans mm -hmm. I'm going to be working on this, this coming winter. Hmm. Will, what are your future plans for Greenland? Uh, the future, right now, the, right now I'm, it's still, it's still on the back burner. I haven't, I haven't dismissed, I haven't dismissed it. And, but right now I'm going to be finishing this project first and then I'll be looking ahead to Greenland, maybe some other, maybe some other approaches since we didn't to doing that expedition, since we didn't get the funding, there could be the possibility of me joining an existing team, which would actually be a lot cheaper, I mean, financially than trying to organize an expedition, and of trying to fund a whole expedition. This is a very broad question. And uh, still, sorry and still uh, be able to achieve the same results and, and still get to do the expedition. Now this is a very broad question, but what would you say your biggest takeaways were from what you've done so far with this tremendous feat? My biggest takeaways are all the people that I've inspired on the, on, on the spectrum and with the with the organization, including myself, and and just the and the awareness that I the awareness that I've generated through this through this project, and which is just getting started at this point. Because now, I mean, I I had just finished this about a month and a half mm -hmm. ago, so now it's I can see it generating, see it building, building up. And so that, so from this time looking forward, I can, I can see, I can see more, I mean, more residual projects coming out of that. Like I just published an article in the Ascendigo newsletter. Mm -hmm. And the other thing, I'm looking ahead to writing, doing a writing on this, possibly writing a, a book on this later on. And that would be and the other thing is just from my own spiritual growth, my own growth in general has been a, a big, huge asset in this. And through that, then I'm able to what, give back to others what was given to me that I can give back and continue that process. Excellent. You should be justifiably very proud. I know you're a humble man, but you've done a great job. We here at Ascend are very proud of you. Well, thank you. Hmm. Thank you, Keith. Welcome to part two of my Einstein book review mini series. If you're a regular viewer of our show, you may remember that in our last episode, I reviewed a book called The Other Einstein. This is a novel that focuses on Albert Einstein's first wife, Mileva, who Albert Einstein met when they were both students at the at a university in Zurich, Switzerland, studying physics together. Now, I'd like to tell you about a book that focuses more on Mr. Einstein. This is called Annus Mirabilis. This focuses on what has been called Einstein's Miracle Year when he published not one, not two, not three, but four scientific papers on physics, including introducing his famous theory of relativity. This is actually two books in one. The first half is a mini biography of Albert Einstein, giving us some insight into Einstein's early life. Then it goes into great detail about the four papers that he published. And then it discusses Einstein's later years, including how he was able to 
escape from Europe in the early 1930s when the Nazis were coming to power. You may or may not know that Einstein was Jewish and how he was able to escape to America. And he ended up at Princeton, which is where he was when he died in 1955. And second half of the book is a reprint of Einstein's 1905 paper introducing his relativity theory, which may or may not interest our readers depending on how interested they are in physics. What makes this book special is that it includes a DVD of A&E's biography episode about Albert Einstein, which gives us some insight into Einstein's scientific research and also his character and his life and his family. So I just want to recommend for that. And speaking of Einstein's family, this is a book that focuses on Einstein's daughter, Lizerl. She was born in 1902 to Einstein's future first wife. They did not get married until after this baby was born. And then in 1903, the baby disappeared in the midst of a terrible scarlet fever outbreak, which killed many children in the area, including possibly Lizero. However, nobody really knows for sure. So this author, Michelle Zackheim, set out to try to find some evidence of what happened to this baby. And she travels all over Serbia in the late 90s because Serbia is where Einstein's first wife, Mileva, was from and where some of her distant relatives continue to live to the time this author was there researching in the late 1990s, which was just after the violent meltdown of Yugoslavia that happened in the early 1990s. Before that, the area suffered the ravages of World War I and World War II. So she's searching for records, but records have a way of becoming casualties to wars. It's also possible that somebody made the records disappear on purpose because this is a culture where rape, murder, and genocide are acceptable, but having a baby out of wedlock is considered one of the most shameful, if not the absolute most shameful things that you can ever do. It would bring shame on your family for generations, even 90 or 100 years hence. So there were some people who were reluctant to speak to this author, but it's a fascinating journey, and in the end, she concludes that Lizero must have died in the scarlet fever epidemic, although the death certificate, if it ever did exist, has never been found. It may have been lost in war, or it may have been made to disappear on purpose by somebody who did not want anyone to find out what happened. And still, this gives us some insight into the characters of both Albert Einstein and his first wife, Mileva, both of whom would likely be diagnosed as being on the autism spectrum if they were born and going to school today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jennifer. Well, that's our final program for 2018, folks, and I hope it has been a good year for you so far, and that 2019 upcoming will be an even better one. So, I'm Keith Halperin. I'm Will Burnick. I'm Paul Nussbaum. And I'm Jennifer Brooks. And this has been uh, Sand Life on the Autism Spectrum. Happy holidays, one and all. See, see everyone. See you. See everyone next year.